Hello and welcome. You are listening to an informed take on current events brought to you by law students and staff of Queen's University Belfast. This is LawPod. Hello, this is Dr. Peter Doran with the latest edition of LawPod. We're going to start with uh, introductions, Thomas and uh, Murray. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, but also the organization and where these ideas have come from. Sure. Uh, thanks for having us. I'm Tom Lindsay, and I'm the executive director and senior counsel for the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And we're kind of a strange combination. We're a law firm, but half our organization are community organizers, and the lawyers really are there to back up the community organizing work that the, that the organization does. But we got our start back in 1995. And uh, for about 10 years, we did conventional environmental law, which uh, in essence meant representing community groups in the states to enforce traditional conventional environmental laws that we have in the states, like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. And uh, after a certain period of time, we came to the conclusion that those environmental laws weren't working, that they were basically about shaving off some of the worst impacts from the projects coming into the communities, but they didn't have anything to do with uh, community uh, consent uh, to those projects coming in. And uh, we were dealing with everything from hydrofracking for natural gas to corporate hog factory farms to the litany of different projects that communities face every day that they don't want that are foisted on them by some of the largest corporations in the land. And so we stopped doing that work. We quit environmental law and we began assisting municipalities, specifically the very smallest towns, townships, villages, uh, counties uh, in the states to uh, buck uh, about a hundred years worth of law that said that they had no power or control to say whether a certain project would come into their community or not. And we began to assist them to assert a uh, right of local community self-government in their own places uh, to say no to those, to those projects coming in the door. So that's the work that we've been doing ever since about 2000 up until today. And uh, Mari? I'm Mari Margill. I'm the Associate Director of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, and I head up our International Center for the Rights of Nature. I know we're going to be talking quite a bit about that today, but we're the International Center is really focused outside of the United States, um, working in different countries with community groups, grassroots groups, um, as well as governments to advance recognizing legal frameworks that establish certain rights of ecosystems and nature, such as rights to exist and to thrive and to regenerate and to evolve. And we've been doing that work um, outside of the United States since 2008, when we first worked with Ecuador's Constitutional Assembly. And today we're working in places like Nepal and India and Australia and Sweden. Um, and here we are in Northern Ireland. That's great. Let's step back, uh, Tom. And I'd like you to describe um, or outline the, the critique from your experience of the uh, the dominant uh, extant uh, environmental law system, which you found insufficient, and then maybe uh, dig down a little bit into the the new paradigm that you're beginning to develop. So, if we could focus a bit on the critique, what are the the the, the main weaknesses in the system that do not match the aspirations of communities at the moment? Yes. So the best uh, the best critique is from the bottom up, which is you're in a community uh, in the states facing a plan by Hatfield Foods Corporation to put a twenty thousand head hog factory farm in your community. The facility and the corporation, uh, their primary responsibility for permitting is through the state and federal government, and once they hold the state and federal government approval. The law in the United States is that a municipality is powerless to stop a project that's been permitted by the state or federal government. That's the black letter traditional conventional law in the United States. You can ask the corporate lawyers, the environmental lawyers, they all agree on one thing, which is that municipalities, i.e. towns, cities, villages, boroughs, counties, have no authority to veto or say no to projects coming in that have been permitted by the state or federal government. 
the environmental laws that exist uh, are essentially about legalizing certain harms. So the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, when communities are facing off against corporations coming into their community, they turn to these environmental laws for relief. But those environmental laws have already set certain standards uh, to govern the issuance of the permits to the corporations. So generally, as environmental lawyers, we were coming in in the ninth inning at the end of the game, which is everything's been issued. The community wants to say no, but under the law of the states, uh, you can't say no because it's been permitted by the state or federal government. So, And then you turn to these other frameworks for remedy. Uh, but the problem is, is that a lot of the regulations that have been promulgated under those federal and state environmental laws have been written by the very corporations that ostensibly they're supposed to regulate. So you have Hatfield Foods and Smithfield Foods Corporation writing the agribusiness uh, factory farm regulations, and you have the development community writing the development uh, regulations, and you have the uh, biggest corporations in the country on mining operations writing the mining regulations. And if we think that those corporations are going to put anything into the regulations that give real power to communities to veto the projects that the corporations are bringing in, that's just insane. Because after all, if you're the one writing the regulations, why in the world would you put anything in there that allows somebody to oppose you uh, or to create a strategy to defeat the placement of your facility there? So we found ourselves for about 10 years just chasing our tails in a regulatory system. We were relegated to trying to find uh, omissions, gaps, deficiencies in the corporation's permit application to then argue that the agencies made a mistake in issuing the permit. But if, uh, And we won. We, we won quite a bit. But the problem is, in the end, the corporation would just come back and patch up the permit application and then resubmit it, and the project would continue in the community where we were working. So in the end, we weren't doing anything at all. And most of the environmental law at this point, as practiced at least in the states, is all about either trying to delay the inevitable or uh, carve off the roughest, some of the roughest impacts from the project, but it has nothing whatsoever to do with the community saying no to the project coming in. And at some point, we, we saw it as an issue of, of rights, which is that the community believes they have a right to clean air and clean water and these other things that are going to be harmed by this corporate project coming in. And yet, those rights are not written in law, they're not enforceable anywhere. And so the basic critique of that environmental regulatory system, which was operating mostly as a hamster wheel, and in fact, somebody much smarter than we were at some point came up with a quote, which I still use, which says that the only thing that environmental regulations regulate are environmentalists, because they make us predicti predictable in how we defend the, a project coming in, how we fight it, because the regulations are written a certain way to regulate our defense. And we've been following it to the letter for 40 years. And in our estimate, uh, that things are worse now by almost every major environmental statistic than they were 40 years ago before the major environmental laws were created in the states. So something's not working. And that's where the critique began. And our work primarily is focused on actually codifying or promulgating those rights into law. So seizing municipalities, uh, seizing them to turn them up against the corporation and the state and federal government to stop the placement of these facilities in those communities, and rewriting their DNA because the municipalities were never intended to be in opposition to the corporations or in opposition to this endless production of more stuff that's ensconced within the economic system that the corporations are operating within but instead to create a new DNA at the municipal level that actually turns them up against the corporation, fundamentally changes the game, writes a new script, creates some new rules, and it runs up, of course, into obstacles created by the corporations as well. But it's the only offense we found that actually energizes people, gets them into a learning process to understand how the system actually functions or doesn't function, and then gives them a game plan to actually begin to change how things operate. Now, I'm just wondering, I suppose, if, if my... Uh uh, if I had to ask one question uh, to be convinced that this is a game changer, I'd be asking, how does this change the balance of power? Because this is a political question in terms of who controls the local government as well as what you're doing with the power. How does it change the balance of power? And in terms of the way in which the game is cha uh, changed, 
what does it look like? Can you give an example? Right. Then, we'll, then we'll go on to Mary. So we work with a lot of elected officials, but a lot of times the elected officials are in favor of the project coming in. So we use different tools, like uh, in the states we have rewriting new municipal constitutions or charters that people can do directly. They don't need the elected officials. They can go over their head. But more importantly, I think your question gets at the fact that there's little little systems change that happens with these individual confrontations between the municipal entity or the people and the corporation. The bigger change is when communities who have done this work in tandem come together to rewrite their own constitutions. So in the states right now, in 10 states, you have communities that have done this, what we call rights-based lawmaking, who have now joined hands to create state-level organizations to rewrite the DNA, the state constitutional DNA, and have joined hands to give birth to a national organization, the National Community Rights Network, which is now focused on changing the federal DNA. So this is about textually changing the constitution pillars and using those individual fights at the ground level as a political and organizing tool. It's not a legal strategy. People say, oh, it's a legal strategy. It's some kind of silver bullet in the law. No, it's not. It's actually that people just don't understand the system they live under, and it's these confrontations that help them see enough to then begin to move towards structural change in the constitutional context. That's the game changer. Uh, and the reason we haven't had it yet in different places, including the states, there's just not enough people who understand how the system functions who frame the problem as a structural problem. And until you get to that point, it's game over. It's You have to give enough people enough room to grow into that space to be able to, to change those constitutional dictates, the DNA of the system. So we're looking at a, a, a structural change. We're looking to the political as well as the legal. Mari, can you pick up the story and make that connection that I uh, invited you to make at the outset? You know, we know what the critique is. We know that it's a, a power game. How do you get from there to advocating the rights of nature within that critique? How does it actually address that critique? The work that we do, um, we believe, builds a great deal on past people's movements. So we teach workshops, um, seminars, and we talk a lot about past people's movements um, in England, in the United States, in terms of the abolitionists, the suffragists, um, in the United States, of course, the civil rights movement and even modern day movements. And what those movements were really focused on was advancing rights. And in order to advance rights, so for example, um, the suffragists, not only a uh, right to vote for women, but other rights, a right to divorce, a right to serve on a jury, a right to be a lawyer, all sorts of rights that women were denied under the law. Um, with slaves, it was not only the abolitionist movement wasn't only about ending slavery, it was about recognizing rights of slaves um, to be citizens, to be able to vote, to own property, and so on. And so we see our work very much in keeping with that in terms of advancing rights. And in order to advance rights, you have to change the system, which today is denying rights. Um, of us to a healthy environment and the rights of nature itself to even exist. Um, and so Thomas was talking about how it's really about structural change, but without understanding how the system works, you're not going to work for structural or systemic change. Um, and that's much like what past movements have done. They've had to reveal or lift the veil on how the existing system, for example, the U.S. Constitution codified slavery, denied rights of women, denied rights of Native Americans and others, and how they had to make constitutional change going right into the fundamental building blocks of our governance to make the kind of change to transform how that system of law worked, in that case, constitutional change. And so we're really about building that kind of movement. And as Thomas said, it's not a, a that's legal change, but that legal strain change doesn't happen unless we have a fundamental societal change. So a cultural shift, that cultural and legal shift essentially go hand in hand. One does not happen without the other. And so we're as much about helping people to understand how the system works, getting their hands dirty with it, and then advancing change beginning in the place where they can right now, which in the States is really at the most local level. And what's been very you know, sort of extraordinary for us being at the sort of beginning of this and working with the first communities to advance in the states these community bills of rights, which advance local rights to self-governance, so local democratic rights for people in a community, and also the first places in the world to recognize rights of nature. And so 2006 was the first rights of nature law that we helped a community in the United States develop and advance and establish into law. And just in 
what, now 10, 12 years, you have not only more than three dozen communities across the United States that have established legal rights of nature, but you now have countries that have done so. And so we see this, you know, this building up from the grassroots that's just accelerated, particularly in the last four or five years. And I, and I think it comes from this place where people are not only really getting a better understanding of how the system is very much about accelerating and legalizing how fast we can use nature, but the impact of that, and that we need to make a fundamental shift in how humankind governs itself toward the natural world, really a fundamental change in our relationship with nature. And that that can't just be that we recycle more or we eat organic food. It really has to be driven into our most basic frameworks of law. Can you give me um, an example or two of uh, maybe one state level Mm -hmm. and one uh, local level um, of a a codification of the rights of nature and maybe describe how it has made a difference? Yeah, so today, just to give a broader context first, you have um, countries such as Ecuador where we worked with their constitutional assembly um, to understand what the rights of nature is. And in 2008, um, Ecuador became the first country in the world to establish a constitutional rights of nature within their national constitution. So you have, Bolivia now has a rights of nature law. So you have several countries that have established this into law. You have um, in India, in the country of Colombia, you have um, courts that have found that nature has certain rights under the law. And in the United States, where we've had a great deal of lawmaking at the local level, you have communities that have done this. And now we have um, in efforts in certain states, as Thomas mentioned, that communities are coming together at the state level to advance change into state constitutions. So the first community in the United States that established the rights of nature into law was called Tamaqua Borough. And they found, as they were facing environmental threats, that existing environmental laws provided them no ability to protect the environment. And it's just a very basic fact. They couldn't protect the place where they live. They couldn't protect their air. They couldn't protect their water. And so they essentially took themselves out from under the existing environmental laws to say, we don't accept that anymore. Uh, We need to do something different if we're going to protect ourselves. So not only did they, you know, say that we as a community need the authority to decide what happens here, their decision was to establish that nature has certain rights and that that was absolutely essential to not only protect the human right to a healthy environment, but nature itself. And in places, so that was in the state of Pennsylvania, and the work has really moved Um, into other states as well since then. So, for example, um, in New Hampshire, which is in the New England states, we have have a state constitutional amendment that's been introduced into New Hampshire legislature twice now and will be introduced again for consideration by the legislators there on both political sides. In the United States, we have the Republicans and Democrats, but it's been sponsored by people from both different parties, which would advance a constitutional amendment which would um, enable communities, give them the decision-making power to establish that nature has rights and that people have certain rights to a healthy environment. So we're seeing this building upward in the states from the grassroots where communities are advancing this change to now moving it into the state level. And in different countries, it's actually moving at the national level, which is an extraordinary rate of change over a short period of time. I'm just wondering if you could pick out uh, one or two examples of where the existence of these rights, these new rights, have actually made the difference in litigation. Um, Because I, I, you know, just from some familiarity with Ecuador, for example, there's some skepticism that uh, it hasn't made the difference. It might have been anticipated that the, the government and the system continue to support the extractive industries, for example. Yeah, in Ecuador. So it's been just over a decade now they've had this in their national constitution and you know, in stepping into the void um, because the government didn't fully embrace this in the Constitution. You've had the courts now, including their constitutional courts, um, that have found, um, affirmed that nature has this constitutional right to exist and thrive and evolve and regenerate. And it stopped certain harms from going forward. And what Ecuador did, essentially what, you know, this kind of idea of the need for cultural change, the shift in how we think about our relationship with the natural world, Ecuador, by putting it into their constitution, really opened up the eyes of people around the world to say, my goodness, this is possible. And so you have um, like the Constitutional Court in Colombia, for example, um, in 2016, 
there's no national rights of nature law in the country of Colombia. But what their constitutional court did, and looking at a case in which um, uh, the Atrato River ecosystem, where there was a significant amount of mining pollution and an impact on the river system, that the court essentially looked outside of the national boundaries of Colombia and said, what is happening within the international sphere that we can bring into our country that will address the fact that we're having these massive impacts on ecosystems. And the Constitutional Court found that the Atrato River ecosystem has certain rights. And you have a process underway now, which the central government and the indigenous people who live within that river ecosystem are working together to determine how do we not only restore this ecosystem, but how do we bring human activity into consistency so that it's upholding the rights of the river that the Columbia Court found. And the and the court was very interesting in its decision in reading it. They actually look at past civil rights movements, people's movements, about the kind of change that they needed to make to make the systemic change that was necessary to recognize certain rights of different people who had been denied rights. And they talked about the need to make this kind of extraordinary change in, in this era of you know, incredible environmental crisis around the world. And the court said, you know, this kind of change, recognizing rights of an ecosystem is absolutely necessary before it's, quote, too late. And so we're seeing these extraordinary changes happening, you know, at the national level on down, um, both in the states and in other countries as well. And just to add a specific example, a litigation basis in the states is that when a municipality, and the example we always use is a little place called Grant Township in western Pennsylvania, it's a mining area, fracking area. We assisted them to pass a ban on frack wastewater injection wells. So all the bad stuff that comes up has to be injected or the company's put into the ground. They wanted to put an injection site there. The community passed a community bill of rights, which included rights of nature. And uh, as soon as they passed the ordinance banning the frack wastewater injection well, they were sued because the corporation sues them for violating the corporation's civil rights under the law, constitutional rights under the law. And in the process of that lawsuit, because the law exists, we were able to intervene, file an intervention status for the ecosystem, for the watershed. So in a very real way, it's practical access to the court system for that ecosystem. And those ecosystem intervention processes have now been run in several places. But it creates standing for the ecosystem and standing for the person to file on behalf of the ecosystem. And now it goes so far as to recognize a guardian or a trustee, in some ways, a voice for the river uh, to bring that to bring that uh, access, that intervention. And then uh, last year, we had this, the seminal case of the Colorado River, uh, where a case was brought on behalf of the Colorado River against the state of Colorado. The state of Colorado and the other states along the Colorado River have been giving out water rights more than the river can give, and so now it dries up before it reaches its end point. And so that was based not on a local law, but actually on the U.S. Constitution, uh, making the argument that the Colorado River was a person for purposes of the 14th Amendment, equal protection, due process, right to life kind of stuff. And so it's opening up these new avenues for environmental lawyers to do their practice. It's opening up standing issues so that ecosystems get into cases. And it's also uh, has resulted in these substantive rulings where you know local governments, the first case brought under the Ecuadorian Constitution was a case called the Vilcabamba River versus the uh, province of Loja. And uh, one thing that's hard to bend our brains around sometimes is that the plaintiff is the ecosystem. The plaintiff's not a person, the plaintiff's the ecosystem. And that was the first case in which the judge ruled in favor of the river. So uh, globally, a global first in which an ecosystem was declared to have certain rights was recognized by the law, and then stoppage of dumping of a road debris into the river that changed its course. And that was the underlying decision in the case. I wonder if you could uh, say something about the implications for property law, because in many ways, all law is an extension of the the, the rights to property and dispose uh, of property. Is there any evidence that this movement will begin to uh, challenge, uh, define the limitations of uh, property law? Yeah, it already has in many places, because when you actually recognize that nature is not property, but that nature is a rights-bearing entity, you're automatically redefining what people's power over property is. 
and defines those limits because part of the bundle of sticks of property ownership is the right to destroy. And in this very raw sense, these rights of nature provisions, which recognize at the very minimum a right to life for the ecosystem, is taking away the right to destroy the ecosystem for the property owner. So it's automatically beginning to peel away those that bundle of rights uh, that uh, we've come to see as a natural Western civilization approach to nature. But that's one of the reasons why the rights of nature stuff is so radical. I mean, it's fundamental stuff. Uh, nature hasn't had rights in the last 3,000 years, uh, doesn't have rights today in most places, and this new area of the rights of nature is a fundamental change to that property ownership uh, attributes of property model that we have. In a way, it's pre-modern and post-modern. Yes. And uh, I wonder, um, I know that you're, you're both from the United States, but to what extent uh, the movement um, is gaining some purchase in the United Kingdom and Ireland. Are you in touch with uh, activists, lawyers, law schools um, who are beginning to take an interest in these issues? Uh, I know that here at Queen's in the law school, we had one of the first uh, modules on wild law, for example. So there is a, there's a, there's the beginning of uh, a response with, among our activists and uh, academic uh, lawyers. So what are you hearing in terms of uh, the picture locally? Yeah, we've definitely been in touch with um, people with communities, with activists in Scotland and England, um, in the Republic of Ireland, and and of course we're visiting here in Northern Ireland um, to do some workshops and talks, as well as meeting with um, communities in different parts um, of Northern Ireland. We're we're finding in um, both the UK and the United States, as well as in other countries, there's kind of a growing common shared understanding that environmental laws, which work very similarly across the world, which regulate how we use nature, um, that that is a, that's not adequate to the task of the environmental crisis that we find today with ecosystem collapse, with species extinction, with climate change, that we really need a fundamental shift. Um, and so that common understanding is people are sort of looking out there into the world and saying, what can we find? And conventional environmental law doesn't cut it. Um, the rights of nature, I think, is really um, a pioneering form where it's really focused on systemic structural change, recognizing that our existing economic systems, our existing environmental laws as part of those, um, just they are not protecting um, nature and, and they're not going to. It's not enough just to, you know, regulate fracking better. When you regulate fracking better, you're still getting fracked and, you know, as on with any other kind of extraction or um, industrial use of nature. And so our conversations um, with people in communities and groups, not only in Northern Ireland and the UK, but elsewhere is not only a frustration, but uh, essentially a resistance to continuing to do the same kind of conventional environmental activism and saying, we need to do something new. Um, and that really is what brought us here. And people said, you know, we we want to learn about that. We want to see what we can do with it. Um, and so we're really, I mean, we're just really pleased to be here to share not only what this work is, but see about actually bringing these strategies into Northern Ireland. It's interesting. We're speaking on the eve of uh, the first substantive uh, meeting of the ad hoc working group on a new global pact. It's a new UN process um, really to bring together uh, the existing environmental principles, but those are the conventional environmental principles. And it seems somewhat ironic that you're saying that we're that we're on the brink of a bit of a paradigm shift, just as the multilateral system is about to codify and tie down the extant system. Is there any evidence, either at the regional level or at the global level, of um, um, disseminating, uh, disseminating the, these ideas into the, the multilateral mm -hmm. environmental system? Yeah, you know, it was a few years ago um, that at the United Nations in New York, that Pope Francis, in talking about the need for fundamental change and how we protect the environment, in his speech before the United Nations General Assembly, he said, a right to the environment does exist, his words. Um, and so you know um, that when the Pope is starting to talk about this, that there, it's gaining purchase. Um, and several years before that, uh, I think it was 2012, if I'm not mistaken, that we were in Cochabamba, Bolivia, 
um, as part of a World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth and participated in the drafting um, of the proposed UN Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth, which is modeled on the UN Declaration on Human Rights. And Bolivia was the first country to bring um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth to the General Assembly for consideration. And there continues to be a great deal of activism around it to not only gather signatures, but to bring more countries um, into agreement that this is something that's really necessary. Um, and so I think that's part of how um, sort of a more global conversation and discourse is taking place. I would also add that part of the, I mean, this is all really new, the rights of nature stuff. In some ways, it's not new at all, because it's an indigenous concept that nature is something else other than property. And so it, it's almost like Western civilization driving indigenous values into this Western system of law to change this particular aspect of it. Um, but normalizing the conversation has been a challenge because five years ago, if you used the phrase rights of nature, people thought you were crazy. And we did a tour. I did a tour with a South African lawyer of law schools, and we had law, environmental law professors walking out within the first 20 minutes of the talk. The students would stay, and they loved the conversation, but the professors would walk out the door. And so now Tulane Law School has had a symposium on the rights of nature. Oliver Houck, who wrote the most of the Federal Clean Water Act in the United States, has now embraced the concept and was a host for the Rights of Nature Conference at Tulane Law School. Vermont Law School just recently had a symposium on it. It's, it's becoming normalized. What it means at a very specific, distinct, level as applied to different ecosystems, a lot of that stuff still has to be figured out. It's at that beginning stage, which is exciting and also very is terrifying at times because it's the beginning of the beginning. But Ecuador in the lead, uh, the municipalities and the states following as a laboratory uh, for experiments on how to define and, and what the reach of it is. I think it's a very exciting time for all this stuff, but uh, normalizing it has been a big challenge. Yeah, we have a, a special relationship in this part of the world with uh, George Mitchell, of course, and uh, he pioneered some of the, uh, I think it was the Clean Air uh, legislation. Um, so he uh, um, connects these issues for us, you know. Can I just uh, ask you one more question? Um, the other interest that we have here in terms of ecology and law is the rise of the, the, the commons movement. And not just uh, the law of the commons, but the notion of commoning. You know, it's really an ontological shift uh, and all of the legal implications that would flow from that. Um, do, do these movements meet in your minds or is it something that you look at? Uh, I have an interest in the work of uh, Capra and Matty, for example. Yeah, the, the, the common stuff is very difficult sometimes to reconcile with the rights of nature. Um, it's simply because when we use the word common, we're basically shorthanding common property. I mean, that's at least that's how we see it. Um, and so there's folks in the, in the States, for example, that are talking about climate as a public trust or as, as part of the commons. And we, we don't think that gets us where we need to go, that it's kind of a dead end. It would almost be like uh, sl having slavery, uh, but slaves that are commonly owned that you're not abolishing slavery at that point. You're just saying that it, the problem can be resolved by having common ownership of slaves. Well, the slaves are still property. It doesn't change that concept. And so common ownership of the, client, of the climate, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that gets us to where we need to go. It's a, it's a rights movement to us. And I think one, one lane ends at a dead end and the other one doesn't. And, but that's a, it's a ripe conversation at this point because people are looking for solutions. And because everything ties back to property, they feel they have a stronger hand if they use something that's tied to property. The problem is once you use it, you're in the, you buy all the baggage that comes with it. And that's part of the, part of the problem. So. And the, the implications for the legal profession, are you beginning to see courses or opportunities for students to uh, acquire the skills and the knowledge to advocate for nature? Yes, we have um, a lot of law students who are still in their first or second year um, of law school coming to us and asking to do internships and research projects and so on. And we're getting a great deal of that. Um, and I think that's part of that. Uh, We've had community. We've had uh, lawyers um, and law students, for example, who've gone through um, our workshops that we call democracy schools, and 
they tell us that it kind of blows up all these myths that they're taught in their conventional law school classes um, about the role of corporations and writing the law and the kinds of rights that they have. You know, they tell us that, you know, it's just assumed in their law school classes that corporations have rights and why would you want to change that? You know, they don't have that kind of debate. Um, and so in some ways we provide um, a forum to really challenge, you know, these things that are accepted as just well-settled law um, and uh, provide an opportunity not only for law students and lawyers, of course, but, um, you know, community activists, people who aren't even activists, who are just wondering why in the world is their community suddenly getting fracked. Um, and so it really opens up that conversation, um, which we've had we've had law students who say that basically they learn more in our 10 hour workshop about how the law really works than in three years of law school, which doesn't, you know, which isn't a terrific um, and not a terrific recommendation, I suppose, for law school. But the idea is, is that, you know, we sort of force them to to question why it, it, things are the way they are. Not that they are that way. They are that way. But why are they that way? And the history behind that and why people and communities are now are beginning to advance this really structural systemic level of change, why that's necessary. It, it, it raises a fundamental question about the responsibility of law schools, doesn't it? Because there are blind spots that are being reproduced and passed on to those who are going through the training. And uh, in many ways, insofar as those blind spots continue, the the, the teachers in the law schools are complicit with uh, the destruction of the, the environment. There's an invitation to? <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'll take it up. Because uh, in the States, at least, the law students coming out uh, are seen as completing their education at the first corporate huge law firm gig that they get. So when you come out of law school in the States, you're not prepared to do anything. It's it's really just a boot camp. Um, and then they send you on your way. And unless you get that job at the large law firm, you don't have a clue what you're doing. So the, the kids that are graduating from law school are, are – um, not filled with anything when they come to us. It's an unlearning process and then a relearning process. So law schools could be a force for good, I think, but they're a long way from that. And in fact, uh, in, in when I was in law school, they teach that environmental laws in the United States are the best in the world, and we export our lawyers to other countries to help them replicate the laws. And so when I came out of law school, I framed the problem not as that the laws were a problem, the way that they were set up or the way they were written or the basic implicit bias in them, but that the problem was not enough lawyers, because in the United States, we only have 200 full-time public interest environmental lawyers. So the reason why the world was falling apart was that we didn't have enough lawyers enforcing the laws. It wasn't the laws themselves. And so we had to do unlearning as well. We, we ran headfirst in communities that said the law is the problem. It's not, not having enough people as part of it to enforce it, but that the law themselves are a problem, because they divest us systemically of decision-making authority over our own futures, kind of. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. And good luck with your work with the local activists and uh, your guests uh, at the meetings that you will convene over the next uh, few days. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thank you. You've been listening to LawPod, an informed take on current events brought to you by the law students and staff at Queen's University Belfast. Our theme music is by Colonel Chocolate and the Justice Triangle, and LawPod is funded by Queen's Law School and the Queen's Annual Fund. You can follow us on social media or on Twitter at QB LawPod. For more information, you can also visit our website, lawpod.org, and please have a look in the show notes for more information about the topics covered today. You can find us on iTunes or anywhere else you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and this was LawPod.